You might wonder sometimes, when you're doing the, the mysteries of the rosary, to meditate, well, what to think about. And sometimes we just have sort of an image, or we maybe might go back to, uh, when we're not wool gathering and distracted, go back to some, maybe some basic and simple ideas. But really, any one, any one of the mysteries of the rosary is so rich. There's a lot to do. You can run out of Hail Marys way before you run out of thoughts. So today, today is the shoulder day. It's the transition day between the nativity, what happens in the nativity. St. John says it in the last gospel. The word was made flesh. The eternal word of God becomes a baby. He takes the true human nature of his virginal mother Mary and dwelt amongst us. And that's what we've been doing, been honoring that truth. God becomes man. What happens tomorrow at Epiphany, which is the great feast of the Christmas season, is that the God who becomes man manifests himself to men as God. And we saw his glory, the glory as it were of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He manifests himself in our response is our answer to that is, I'm coming, Lord. I'm coming. Yesterday on the plane coming up here, it was cute. There was this little girl who was wandering around as children will, uh, just at the, at the uh, on, on the boarding thing, you know, the connection to the plane, you're dropping off, you're carrying on luggage. And I thought to myself, now where is she going? And the mother eventually got, you know, got with it again, and she said, we called her by her name, and she said, and the little girl said, I'm sure, imitating what she'd heard from her elder, she said, I'm coming. And then she said again, I'm coming. That's exactly what we want to do when we're called. As the Magi were, by the light of faith, the star, I'm coming. We have at this season of the year some wonderful, very, very holy, early Americans who could be easily forgotten. They're not legal or truly canonized in the true Catholic Church, the Novus Ordo has a miscanonized. But, but for all of that, we should not forget, I think, the beautiful example that they give us. They're really thinking of three saints today that can help us to <coughs> keep Our Lady company. She asked for that 15 minutes of, dedic- of meditation, but the, par- the time that you use for your listening to the sermon and then just reflecting on a little bit afterwards, count for that. You can make it to the first Saturday Mass and sermon. The first of these is our the Pope whom we commemorate today, St. Telesphorus. He was a Pope and a martyr. He was the eighth successor to St. Peter. And they say that of him, that he was the Pope who put the Gloria, the hymn of the angels, into the Mass. Only for centuries, only the Pope, or then after that, the bishop was allowed to do it. And then later on, it was permitted at Easter to the priest. And by the Middle Ages, a priest on every feast day, as well as a bishop, could recite or sing the Gloria for the Mass. They say he's the Pope who organized Lent, the Lenten fast, and then he was the Pope who decreed that Easter should always be kept on a Sunday, because in the early church, starting in the East, there was a custom of observing Easter according to the Jewish Passover, because that's, of course, when our blessed Savior died, on the day of the the, the Pasch, or the Passover. But then with the passage of time, it was seen to be unseemly for Christians to be following the Jewish calendar. And there, and since Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the Pope said, I'm going to celebrate Easter on Sunday. And in the East, they didn't. It's a curious thing, you know, even today, you know, sometimes, you know, if you, if you get reading about this and that, there's, with your different traditional groups, there's disputes about Easter and the Easter ceremonies holy week. But this Pope, uh, gave the, uh, the good example. That is to say, he observed this custom and decreed that it should be so. But for those in the East who wanted to still do things the way they were raised doing it, he said that would be fine too. He didn't break communion with them. He, he kept peace with them. He's an, he's an Easter as well as a great Christmas saint to less for us. Yesterday was the day of death of Mother Seton, Mother Elizabeth Seton, who's a great convert. What She was a wealthy, high-class Episcopalian. Her husband uh, had business reversals, got sick. They went to Italy to try to recover. They had some friends there, and her husband died. But 
while she was in Italy, she was staying with these friends, the Catholic life, the church, and she felt so drawn to church and to the Blessed Sacrament, the light of faith, like the star for the wise men. And eventually, she had to leave everything, like the wise men, to become a Catholic. Her family disowned her. She was reduced to poverty. How would she take care of her girls, her daughters? Well, a priest, one of the early pioneer priests in, in, in America at that time, suggested to her that she open a little school. And that little Catholic school that she opened for girls eventually became the Daughters of Charity or the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph, a wonderful religious order, and many, many schools and missions throughout the whole United States, but it was her hunger for the communion, her desire to visit our Lord in the tabernacle, knowing that truly God does live in our midst. When we saw his glory, we see his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Today is the anniversary of the death of the venerable John Neumann, who was for eight years Bishop of Philadelphia. And he was born in Bohemia, and at that time, it's today the Czech Republic, at that time, if you can imagine, they had too many priests. And the bishop, was, he declared a moratorium on ordaining priests. If you wanted to be ordained, you had to go someplace else. And so, and because the state was very, the state ran the church, and in fact, they paid the salary, and uh, actually decreed that, that the teaching, and sometimes the teaching in the university is just very modernistic and bad. Well, he uh, joined the, uh, the he uh, volunteered as a missionary and came over to this country, the United States, was ordained by a bishop very eager to have help. And then after a while, he realized for his own sanctification, he didn't want to be by himself. So he joined the Redemptorists, and he became a wonderful preacher, Redemptorist father. Then he was chosen to be the bishop of Philadelphia. He was only for eight years, but in those eight years, he organized a system of parochial schools and the 40 hours. You have the 40 hours here over, the, over your feast day weekend in November. Great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, to the Blessed Mother, and to the poor, and to the Irish, let it be said. He was so devoted as a bishop, he spoke many languages, but so that he could take care of his flock, his immigrant flock. Then he had some Irish that came over, and don't you know, they didn't speak English, they spoke the old Irish, Gaelic. And he, I can't imagine, but I looked at Gaelic grammar once, it's very complicated. But he learned Gaelic so that he could hear the confessions of his Irish one. What a wonderful, wonderful priest. And with all, he was very, very poor. At some point, one of my favorite stories about him is at some point, he was he came back to the rectory, uh, and his feet were wet, his shoes were wet. And somebody, one of the other priests said to him, Your Excellency, you really need to change your shoes, they're wet. You, you, you're out in the storm today. And he said, Well, if I were to change my shoes, my friend, I would just have to put my right shoe on my left foot and vice versa, because I've only got one pair. He lived the poverty of the Redemptorist order, because he had given everything for our Lord. He loved the poor very, very much. He's another epiphany saint, isn't he? These are ways in which devout souls, like the Magi of old, answer the call, the intuition, the gift, the grace of the faith. Jesus, who was born sweetly in the, in the crib these days when we've been adoring, now manifests his glory. And it's up to us. Those same graces are given, you know. They're, they're no less given to us than they were to them. If we're not quite up to that standard, then it's, we should look to our own account. Ask Our Lady at the crib, ask the Magi, and ask the great American religious and bishops of the past to inspire you that when the call comes, little grace, little inspiration, that you'll answer it. The Venerable John Neumann used to tell people, you weren't born just to work, to raise a family, to have your little joys, commit your sins, and when you felt like it, to repent again. You were raised to do something for God. That's why God put you on this earth. Epiphany is a good time to remember that. You can conclude your little Epiphany meditation, third joyful mystery, by offering Our Lady some good practical resolutions for the new year. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.